So thanks for coming. Uh, it's great of you to come and check this out after a long day at school. Uh, so yeah, I'll be talking about food webs. And so here's classically what people think of when they think about feeding interactions. Oh, and by the way, feel free to ask me questions or to you know, make comments. This isn't meant to be just me blathering for an hour straight. That would be very boring for me and for you. So feel free to chime in. But um, so this is a classic predator-prey interaction. Uh, so lion kills the zebra, eats the zebra, zebra goes away, lion gets biomass. Um, however, there's a lot of different types of feeding interactions out there in the world. And when we think about feeding interactions, really we're, all that we're concerned about is whether there's a transfer of biomass from one organism to another organism. So up here we have beetles munching on some plant, and you know the plant will survive, unlike the zebra, but it's going to lose some of its vegetation. We have a bee pollinating a flower, um, and the bee's getting nutrition uh, from the flower in addition to giving a positive effect to the flower. Uh, down here we have a cow um, and a calf feeding off the mother cow, and this actually is a feeding interaction, of course. And so technically cows and all other mammals are cannibals because this is an instance where you have one organism from a species feeding on uh, an organism from the same species. So humans are actually obligate cannibals in the same way that cows are, which people don't really think about much. Um, here's another kind of trophic interaction. This is a little different. So here we've got a vulture feeding on the carcass of a fox. So in this case, it's sort of feeding on the fox, but sort of not. The fox was, ar was already dead. The vulture didn't kill it. So this is actually a detrital interaction. Um, so detritus is just kind of dead organic material of any kind. And um, detrital interactions are really important parts of feeding interactions and food webs. And then who can tell me what this is? What? But what's going on with that caterpillar? What feeding interaction is happening? Yeah, so this is uh, <laughs> an example of uh, parasites feeding on a caterpillar. So, um, and we'll get to parasites. We're going to talk about them in a minute. So this is the way that most people get exposed to feeding interactions. Um, and some of you may have even seen this in an elementary school class at some point. This is a page from a textbook. And it shows a food chain. So over here is a terrestrial food chain, plant eaten by an herbivore, eaten by a mouse, eaten by a snake, eaten by a hawk. Over here is a marine food chain, starting with phytoplankton, eaten by zooplankton, eaten by smaller fishes, bigger fishes, and a marine mammal. And uh, so this is a very simplistic way of thinking about feeding interactions, but it's, a, it's an okay place to start, but it's definitely not where you should stop. So, okay, don't worry about reading this. <laughs> I just want to point out that People have been thinking about feeding chain, food chains and feeding interactions for a long time. And these are a bunch of quotes from people in the 1700s. And some of them are kind of funny. Um, uh, this one is by Jonathan Swift. Um, have any of you read Gulliver's Travels? So it's the author of Gulliver's Travels. And he wrote, uh, so I forget where he wrote, he wrote this on, in a, something called On Poetry, a Rhapsody. So naturalists observe a flea. So here we have our flea. Uh, hath smaller fleas uh, that, uh, that on him prey. So here we've got smaller and smaller fleas. And these have smaller yet to bite them, and so proceed ad infinitum. <laughs> so very nice little poem about a food chain of a particular kind. Um, and then there's other people, Carl Linnaeus, who's the father of modern taxonomy and binomial nomenclature. Um, he wrote, thus the tree louse lives upon plants, the fly called Musca aphidora, uh, Aphidivora lives upon the tree louse, the hornet and housefly upon the musca aphidivora, dragonfly upon the hornet and wasp and fly, spider on the dragonfly, small birds on the spider, and the hawk on the small birds. So for some reason, a lot of people in the 1700s were really starting to think a lot about food chains. But really what we want to do, and the, what I study, is you, all the, you go out to a habitat and get all the different food chains for all the species that live in that habitat, and you weave them together. You basically mesh them together into a network. And so this is one example of someone's uh, visualization of a, some of the species for Lake Michigan. 
And so down here you have phytoplankton, and then there's some zooplankton that feed on the phytoplankton, and the arrows show the flow of biomass from, you know, from zo uh, phytoplankton up to zooplankton. There's some fishes and then some larger fishes, and uh, there's even a couple of parasites included in this food web. So this looks, you know, complex, but not hopelessly complex, but really all it is is a bunch of food chains stuck together. Um, but by portraying um, feeding interactions in this way, it gives us a lot of power to try to start untangling the complexity of ecosystems and how they're organized and, and what their dynamics are and how they function. So now let's go back in time again really quickly. <laughs> but now we're going just back to 1880. Um, and this is the first known diagram ever produced of a, of a food web. And so this was published by an Italian scientist named Lorenzo Camerano. Um, it's, it's really hard to read, um, but it actually does include 15 different kinds of taxa, including these things, plants, parasitic plants, amphibians, reptiles, fish, birds, mammals, um, insects. And he, one of the things that he wrote in this paper, and this was a scientific paper he published in an Italian scientific journal um, in 1880, a great number of animals can be at the same time prey of other animals and subjected to various kinds of parasites, and also predators of parasites of other animals, which can be predators of parasites of others, et cetera. So he was way ahead of his time. He published this, and it was promptly lost to science until 100 years later, uh, when one of... Uh, my colleagues, Jill Cohen, um, discovered it somehow <laughs> and had it uh, translated and republished and brought this back to light. So this is how we visualize food webs now, or this is one of the ways we visualize food webs. And at the end, I'll actually pop up some software. And this, is, this image was produced with software that my colleagues and I developed uh, called Network 3D. And um, if any of you are interested in it, it's freely available. Um, it only runs on a, on a Windows environment, unfortunately, right now. But um, So this is an image of Little Rock Lake, um, of the food web for Little Rock Lake in Wisconsin, um, which has 181 taxa, several fishes, about 11 fishes, 110 invertebrates, um, 59 autotrophs, so the primary producers down here, and a detrital group. And, um, and what we do when we look at food webs, when we start to think about how we compare this food web to that food web, because we're not just interested in singular food webs, first of all, um, we aggregate all the species in the food web that have the exact same set of predators and prey. And so that gives us a trophic species. So each of these is a functionally distinct set of species or a single species. So there's 92 species in here. So these are the nodes. And then there's almost 1,000 links among all those species which means on average there's about 11 links per spe for every species. And then there's this concept of trophic level. And trophic level, um, in this case the average trophic level is 2.4. It just means on average how far are each of these species from primary producers. So it gives you a measure of kind of, of the height of the food web. And, um, you know, so for any species up here, there's going to be multiple pathways that link it to different primary producers down here. And so you average across those. And then you average across all the species to get this mean trophic level. And you'll see that again. So um, who can tell me what this is, this little nose ring? What do you think that indicates? Yes, it indicates a cannibalistic link, exactly. So, and actually, you don't, you see a bit of it in this food web. Um, it turns out cannibalism is really common um, out in natural systems. Um, so it's, uh, it's much more common than people realize, I think. So I'm gonna go back to parasites. So one of the things with most of the food webs that people have studied over the last 20 years is they actually tend to ignore parasites. Most of the work has been on just kind of, uh, you know, charismatic large trees and animals um, and other kinds of plants. And, um, you know, not much has happened in terms of, even though Lorenzo Camerano back in 1880 talked a lot about parasites, we kind of forgot about them for 100 years. But I've been working uh, with some parasitologists um, associated with UC Santa Barbara, University of California, Santa Barbara, and the U.S. Geological Survey, who got interested in food webs and were like, hey, this is crazy. There's huge diversity of parasites in the systems that we study, yet food webs completely ignore them. We need to do something about this. 
So we've, we've been getting together for a few years and putting together some new kinds of data and doing some new analyses. And so this is um, a food web for an estuary, Estero de Punta Banda, um, which is in the Gulf of uh, California. And um, so it's in Mexico. And so this just shows uh, the food web without any parasites in it. So here's the primary producers down here. And then uh, basically all the other, mostly invertebrates and some fishes and other things. Um, so this has 106 species in it. Again, about 1,000 links, about two links per species and a trophic level of about 2.6. So it's actually pretty similar to that Little Rock Lake food web that we just looked at. But what happens uh, if we add parasites to this picture? What do people think it's gonna look like? A lot more interactions. A lot more species. Okay, so the blue things are parasites in this system. And um, all of a sudden, we've popped our species richness, and the S means species richness, the number of nodes, up to 185. We've almost doubled it. We've far more than doubled the total number of links in the system, gone from about 1,000 to almost 3,000. And um, also really increased the links per species, and the trophic level has gone way up. Yes? Definitely, okay. definitely. And so one thing, and that's a really good question, one thing that I should note about this, this is actually just data for metazoan parasites. So, um, so multi-celled sort of, you know, fairly large things. And um, this doesn't include all the viruses and it would be even more complicated, much more complicated than this. So this is really just showing a, a small fraction of the possible parasites and viruses, yes? In um, basically parasites, um, uh, they live on and feed on the species, so they have a very close tro they have a very close physical intimacy with their host. Whereas in a classic predator prey interaction, uh, the things are free living. So parasites always have a stage that's not free living, where they're actually living in, an in or on a host. They can also have free living stages. And that's one of the things, parasites are also very interesting and, and differ in some other ways from predators in that they often have these very complicated life cycles. And you've probably heard stories about the parasite that gets into a grasshopper and basically starts eating away at its brain in a very particular kind of way. And all of a sudden the grasshopper um, loses its fear of water. So normally grasshoppers won't go near water. So this parasite alters its behavior by messing with its brain. The grasshopper then jumps into the water. It's immediately eaten by a fish, if a fish is around. And that fish is necessary for that parasite to complete its life cycle. So the parasite ends up parasitizing the fish. And so you can get these very complicated cycles of hosts and feeding interactions um, because of parasites. So they're incredibly fascinating for many reasons. Um, and, you know, and the other thing is that everything that people consider to be a top predator in a system, you know, humans, wolves, you know, whatever you want to name, lions, none of them are top predators. They all have large parasite loads. And, and so, you know, every supposed top predator actually isn't. And, it, and you also get layers and layers of parasites or parasitoids in some cases where you can have parasites of parasites and parasites of parasites of parasites. So it gets pretty interesting quickly. <laughs> so one of the things, we can do one more, yeah, go ahead. What are the, are there, if there are, what are the consumers of parasites? Uh, we're gonna get to that actually. You just set up my next little piece of this slide. <laughs> so let me do that. Well, first of all, I mean, as I was just saying, parasites can parasitize parasites in some cases. So you get a consumer host interaction there sometimes. But the other thing is if you think about it, um, any time that a predator eats a prey that has parasites, it's also eating the parasites. Um, we call that incidental predation or concomitant predation. So it's basically the predator isn't necessarily trying to eat the parasites, but it ends up eating them anyway as a part of eating the prey. And uh, so it's a little bit like Horton, here's a who. Uh, <laughs> so this is where we've added in these incidental predation links. And so what happens, you don't increase the number of species in the system, but you really increase the number of links. We've now gone from 1,000 links to almost 3,000 links to getting up towards 5,000 links. And while you know, some people argue, oh, well, when the pre predator eats the parasites of the prey, 
it's not really a big source of nutrition for the predator, so we should ignore them. But the thing is, it's, it's a really big impact on the parasites, of course. And um, <laughs> so, I mean, they care about it, and it has implications for the stability of parasite populations and also which feed back into the whole food web. So, um, so yeah, and the other thing to notice also is that we've also really increased the trophic level again, so up almost to five. This is a very tall, uh, complex food web. Yeah. Um, bec yeah, just because there's more long pathways to get to the bottom, and since you're averaging across everything, you're popping that average up. So. Yeah, so um, in this, there are some parasites that have direct links to, and there are parasites of plants. Um, and some people are doing studies now to basically try to understand the distribution of parasites across different trophic levels and to understand whether they're more, you know, highly represented at upper trophic levels, which is what it looks like for this data set, or whether, you know, this is probably just an artifact of them not identifying a bunch of kinds of parasites that can occur in and on plants. So you have to be really careful in interpreting the data because you have to understand the limitations and the biases inherent in the data. And that's something we're always trying to be aware of when we're doing this. And I think there was a question over here. There is a question about the diagram as well. Uh-huh. Uh, is that just for illustration purposes or is there some usefulness with all those things? Yeah, it's really, it's, it's mostly a pedagogical tool. <laughs> but um, it also, I mean, until we had this software where we could visualize this way, people would try to hand draw food webs, which is fine when you have like 20 taxa and maybe 40 links. Um, but you start getting into these more complex data sets like the ones that we work with now, and, and you can't hand draw it. And if you did, it looks like this horrible plate of spaghetti. And people would actually, I remember people in the early days when I was doing this, um, holding up you know, hand-drawn pictures that looked like hairballs and saying, look, this is way too complicated. We can't understand anything about it. They would actually use it as an excuse for why we should just give up and not try to study food webs. And um, that's completely crazy. <laughs> so, in fact, you know, characterizing it as a network, we can then do a lot of quantitative analysis on it. Um, the one thing, as I've been talking about, that this really does impart ecological and biological information is this trophic level, sort of the vertical axis um, imparts trophic level information. And you can do other things with the visualization to make certain axes correspond to different kinds of ecological information. Um, and then you can also do things like look and say, oh, the plants don't look like they have any parasites. What's going on? You know, so. so we actually, we've occasionally kind of come up with new hypotheses about food web structure based on just looking at these images where we were like, wait a second, that looks weird or that's something new or something different that I didn't really notice before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now they're just the colors I pick because they contrast with each other. But yeah, green is primary producer. And then I just wanted to have contrast and color for um, uh, the parasites are blue and the free living species are red. Yeah. I should have put a key up there. So you'll see different modes of coloring things for later. And I have in the future slides with colors, I have keys. So thanks for asking. So I'm gonna move away from parasites and talk a little bit about ancient ecosystems. Um, and all the, these first three things that I'm talking about are actually ongoing projects um, that involve compiling new kinds of data and analyzing new kinds of data. That, and these are very novel data sets. I mean, the, we have seven of those food webs with really detailed parasite information that are very highly resolved. Um, there's a lot of resolution in terms of the species present and the links. And that's all, that's very new to food web research. This is also really new to feed food web research, although it's going back in deep time. So this is a fossil from about 49 million years ago. Does anybody know what that's a fossil of? Any guesses? Shout something out. Horse? It's a horse that's about that big. So it's one of the early horses um, in the early evolution of horses when they were kind of dog-sized. <laughs> so um, we're going to go back in time, like I said. Here's the geologic time scale. Um, here is uh, going back to 540 million years ago. How many people have heard of the Cambrian or the Burgess Shale? 
So yeah, so the Burgess Shale um, is probably, it is the most famous fossil assemblage. Um, uh, and it's from the dawn of, of the explosion of multicellular life on Earth, um, which was about a half billion years ago. And I do have some work that pertains to the Cambrian, but I'm gonna talk about something a little different today. I can't talk about everything, but um, I do have a paper on, on Cambrian food webs. But I'm gonna, we're gonna pop up to much more recent in time. So here's the present, here's where we are in the Holocene. So if we go back um, 49 million years to the Eocene, uh, we get to the Messel Shale, which probably none of you have ever heard of, I would guess. <laughs> but it is one of the most amazing fossil assemblages out there. I mean, it's just incredible. I had never heard of it until I started working with paleobiologists. And um, so the Messel Shale, this is uh, sort of a visualization of what the ecosystem looked like. It, it includes a steep-sided small lake, that's this, and then surrounded by paratropical forest. This is actually found near Frankfurt, Germany. Of course, the continents were all different back then, so this was more in a tropical region. And, um, and one of the things that's really amazing about this uh, assemblage is that what you had was that at various times, uh, you had uh, degassing from the lake, um, which basically came out and smothered all of the living organisms, the plants and the animals and everything. It just kind of killed everything all at once. And then everything would wash down into the lake and it would get settled down into the soft mud and sediment. And you get this entire, uh, basically, preservation of the entire ecosystem of all the species, and including soft-bodied things, which normally don't get preserved well. And so you end up with this incredible record in the rock, basically, of an entire ecosystem. But of course, it takes really amazing experts in paleobiology to kind of pick that apart and try to figure out who was there and what they were doing. Um, and the other thing to note is that, although this is 49 million years ago, and that sounds like a really long time ago, which it was, <laughs> uh, this is basically a modern fossil assemblage and uh, or a modern uh, animal and plant assemblage. Um, you know, like with the horses, the things that are in the system look like things we have today, but the species are different, the sizes are different, the roles they played might have been a little different, but it's effectively a fairly modern system. So here's some of the biota and also evidence for feeding links um, for some of the species in the Messel Shale. And of course, it's fairly easy to understand that paleobiologists go out and figure out what the different species are, looking at the fossils. But they could also figure out a lot about the ecology of the species um, in different ways. So here's what I like to call the smoking gun fossil. <laughs> so it's a little hard to see, but this is a predator of one fish species. And this is the prey of a smaller fish species. It's actually in its mouth. It was in the process of feeding on the smaller fish when it got smothered and they both died. And we don't get this very often, but clearly there's a feeding interaction going on. Um, more often we get things like, uh, the guy that I work with on this, he's from the Smithsonian, his name's Conrad Labandera, he's the world's expert on fossil plant insect interactions. So he can look at a leaf, a fossil leaf like this, he can identify that leaf to the species of plant, then he can look at these damage patterns on the leaf, and he can associate those with the mouth parts of particular insect species in the fossil record. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I mean he, he can see the mouth, but in a separate fossil. So he's putting all this information together. It's completely mind-blowing. I am so happy there are people like him in the world because I couldn't do it. <laughs> so here's some more damage. There's eggs on this, uh, on this leaf uh, from a damselfly. Um, who knows what coprolites are? Yes? Is anybody? Come on, I know someone's got to know what these are from fish and, croc fish and crocodiles back there. Yep, fossilized poop. And actually, um, in, in some cases in the fossilized uh, poop, you can actually find uh, bits of insects or other things that you can actually identify again to the species. Um, there's a lot of gut contents for these animals. So here's that little horse. Um, and in its gut, uh, uh, Conrad and other people have identified leaf cuticle for a particular kind of uh, plant and also grape seeds. Um, you can also tell a lot about what a species can and can't eat or can and can't be eaten by in terms of their morphology, how they're built. So for example, this uh, little critter has, uh, has teeth that are adapted for feeding on hard seeds. Um, 
uh, where is, oh yeah, well, yeah. So, I, and basically, so yeah, you can tell from mouth parts what they can eat, and also the size of it, um, whether it can be eaten by certain kinds of things. So, just to comment on a couple of uh, interesting feeding interactions in the mesal shale. Um, let me just see what, um, this is a pangolin. Who knows what pangolins are? Yes? Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's, they're actually really cool. I mean, they're, and so there were pangolins back in the mesal shale, and pangolins in today, in, in, on the earth today, are obligate anteaters. Um, they, they only eat ants. However, back in the mesal shale 49 million years ago, the anteaters were actually plant eaters. Um, they didn't eat ants. <laughs> but they weren't very good about eating plants. They would actually, they had this little trick where they would go and they would lie in wait next to a leaf cutter ant trail and the leafcutter ants would come along carrying bits of leaves on their back, and uh, this pangolin would steal the bits of leaf off their backs. <laughs> um, but of course, in the process of doing that, it would suck up the occasional ant, <laughs> and just incidentally, again, this incidental kind of link. But over time, over the course of 49 million years, um, it, it started getting more and more nutrition from the ants themselves, and so it slowly shifted from being an obligate plant eater to an obligate ant eater. So that's, that's a kind of cool story. In some cases, down here, this is evidence of an armored scale insect on a palm of a specific species. This interaction hasn't changed at all in 49 million years. It's basically hasn't evolved one bit. It's the same as it was back then. Why do you think that is? Uh, there's been no pressure for it to change, and there was no sort of, um, there was no reason for it to change, basically. It was this, clearly, this palm, you know, basically, changed so little that this scale insect didn't have to change in order to take advantage of it. And so there's just, it depends sort of on what pressures, environmental pressures, and what opportunities you're presented with, whether you evolve slowly or quickly or, or whether you go extinct. So it's a balance, basically. Um, here's an example. This is a little hard to see. I don't know if you can see this. This is a giant bird. That's a nine foot tall bird, eight foot tall bird. Um, it's one of the few fossil animals that has a common name. It's called the terror bird, I think for fairly obvious reasons. <laughs> you know, it's this big and it's really scary. And uh, much bigger than our current largest birds. And it was very predatory. In fact, this is one of, apart from parasites, this is our main top predator, and that's, or one of our main top predators in that system. So in its mouth, this is what you may not be able to see, is one of those little horses. <laughs> So this is an example where in this system, there weren't um, mammal carnivores. They hadn't sort of uh, evolved and be, to be dominant predators in the system. So birds filled the niche that is now filled by things like wolves. And so this is a case where um, the trophic role has changed over time. And also the sizes of things have flipped. You know, the horses have gotten much bigger <laughs> and the birds have gotten much smaller. What? <laughs> yeah. All good questions. <laughs> I can't answer all of them, but um, I mean, you know, eventually I think the birds were outcompeted by mammal predators for various reasons, and so it was no longer, they couldn't fill these, these trophic niches anymore, and so um, there was pressure on them basically just to be smaller and, and less intensely predatory. And, you know, the horses, um, by getting bigger, um, they can move faster, they can get away from predators easier. Um, so there's, again, there's kind of this shifting set of potential explanations why things might change in particular directions, often having to do with predatory interactions, but not only. You, this bird could not fly, fortunately, but it could run really fast. <laughs> it was not a pterodactyl. <laughs> so here's the food web. Um, this, is, this is actually a mind-blowingly large detailed food web. It's, it has 700 species in it, um, almost 6,000 links, feeding links between them. It's got a pretty um, aver uh, short average trophic level, ju just about two. Um, and the reason why that is, and this is a much better data set than we actually have for modern terrestrial systems, <laughs> which is very strange. I know that we have to go back 49 million years to get a really good data set together. But because my collaborator is the world's expert on fossil plant insect interactions, he could really highly resolve both the species and the interactions between the plants and the insects. 
And so that also means that you're dropping the average trophic level down because it's really weighted very heavily on the bottom, which is really where the diversity is. I mean, the diversity is in invertebrates and insects in any ecosystem. And so in this case, the coloring's a little different. The green are plants, algae, and diatoms. The blue are bacteria, fungi, and detritus. The yellow are invertebrates, and the orange are vertebrates. And that's just more detailed explanation of the different critters that were in there. But if you want to know the quality of a food web data set, look to the insects and the invertebrates. They should be hugely dominant in terms of the diversity of the system. If they're not, there's some very systematic biases in your data. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, that's kind of what I was getting at back here. This is, we basically infer the links from evidence we get from the fossil record. So, um, gut contents, um, you know, the smoking gun of the well, fish eating the fish. All those connections are inferred from the... Exactly. And so, and what we do actually, um, so there's, there can be multiple lines of evidence um, that support, so every link's a hypothesis, basically. It's a hypothesis of an interaction between two species. And there can be multiple lines of evidence that point to every given link. And we also assign a certainty level of one, two, or three, uh, high, medium, or low, or, or the reverse, actually, um, to each link based on the lines of evidence it's based on. So if it's gut contents, it's very high certainty. We, ba we know it happened. <laughs> And then by assigning certainty levels to the different links in the system, we can then evaluate whether, when we go to understand the structure, whether it changes when we remove those uncertain links. Because basically, if our understanding is not robust to you know, pulling out those kinds of links, then we've got a problem in interpreting our data. In this case, it turns out that 75% of the links are middle or high certainty. And uh, pulling out the uncertain links doesn't change our understanding at all, which is great, so. So here's that full food web I just showed. We actually end up splitting it into two different food webs, a lake food web and then the forest food web. And uh, so the lake food web has about uh, a little under 100 species and 500 links and it's got a higher average trophic level. The forest web is where most of the diversity is, and again, that's because of those plant-insect interactions, with 630 species and 5,500 links. So this is just, again, you know, sort of how we start playing around with this data and trying to understand what's going on in terms of the species interactions in different habitats. Okay, so now we're gonna jump forward a little bit in time. <laughs> Um, and leave uh, the fossil record behind, um, and we're gonna move on to Homo sapiens. Um, and of course, Homo sapiens are of great interest to Homo sapiens. And <laughs> uh, when I spoke with uh, Mary Charlotte uh, for the radio show this morning, um, we spent a lot of time talking about humans and food webs. It's only one part of my research uh, agenda, but you know, definitely a very interesting one. <laughs> So I've had the, one of the amazing things about the work that I do, as I think you're probably getting a sense of, is I get to work with all different kinds of scientists. And uh, so I'm constantly learning new things. So I've, I've already shown you I've been working with parasitologists, uh, I've been working with paleobiologists, and now I'm gonna talk about working with archeologists and anthropologists. And it's just been an incredible pleasure to constantly get exposed to new bodies of knowledge all the time. You know, I grew up wanting to be an archaeologist or a paleobiologist, and I didn't, but I grew up to play with archaeologists and paleobiologists, so it's nearly as good. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna go up to Alaska. So here's Alaska, and here's this little square. This is the Aleutian Island chain off the tip of Alaska. And so this little box corresponds to this box, which shows the tip of Alaska and then the first island off the tip of the Alaskan Peninsula, and then just uh, south of that, in the Gulf of Alaska, is the Sadak Archipelago, a small set of islands um, that are located right here, basically. And here's a blow up of Sadak Island, and uh, so this is an island in the Aleutian chain. It's been ice-free for about 16,000 years. There's a 6,000-year record of human habitation so uh, the Aleut are the native peoples that live in the Aleutian Islands, and they've been doing that for thousands of years. 
Um, the little yellow dots show uh, all the home sites on the island um, for that entire 6,000 year period. Uh, the island was abandoned by the Sanak Alley in the 1960s. They moved to the peninsula because it was easier for them. They wanted to work in the canneries. It was just, it, it was a pretty tough existence living out here. And there's been commercial harvesting for about 200 years of otters, cod, salmon, and halibut at various times. So, um, basically, what we wanted to do, uh, this is a part of a big project that's funded by the National Science Foundation um, to look at the biocomplexity of the Sanak Archipelago. So, basically, look at how humans fit in with the ecology, fit in with the environment, the climate, and basically how they're all kind of impacting and feeding back on each other over 6,000 years. So I was brought onto the project for the obvious reason, which was to try to figure out if for the first time we could explicitly include humans into a, into a detailed food web. It's never been done before, surprisingly. So, um, but there you have it, a new opportunity. Um, so now the question is, I mean, just as you've seen with these other data that I've been showing, you know, how do you compile data uh, for this to include humans explicitly in a food web? So these are the different ways that data were compiled. Um, First of all, there's a couple of my colleagues, Spencer and Rolly. This shows them out in the intertidal around Sanak, making, uh, doing surveys of intertidal life, basically. So they did systematic surveys of the diversity of the intertidal. And, um, and Spencer has put together this massive database of species and trophic interactions for uh, the North Pacific marine system. Um, so that's how we're, th and the thing is also over 6,000 years, there's no evidence that particular, that very few species went extinct or invaded. I mean, there's a couple of exceptions, but it's a fairly stable ecological community. But how do you get humans in that? Over here is a trash heap. Uh, this is an excavated trash heap outside of one of the home sites where the archeologists go and they do cores and the trash heaps are called middens. So they do cores, so they actually get this temporal core of gunk out of the trash heap. And what the trash heap is mostly composed of is shell and bits of bone from things that the humans were feeding on. And so the zooarchaeologists um, would go and pick all that apart and they'd identify all the different species associated with those shells and bones. Um, and then this is augmented, all this with literature searches in terms of uh, feeding interactions, both for non-human species and human species. Uh, there's ethnographic data and also interviews with Aleut elders to talk about the kinds of things that they were eating that um, aren't found in the middens. So that can include, you know, different kinds of algae and stuff. So this is just, you don't need to read this, this is just an image of a bunch of different species just in the intertidal that the Aleut fed on. So it's everything from algae to octopus to urchins uh, to different kinds of mollusks, sea cucumbers, shrimps, crabs, um, fishes, I don't know if there's, yeah, here's a fish, great sculpin. This is just a, actually a small fraction of the species that the human hunter-gatherers were feeding on. And here if we go back to that simple food chain concept, um, this shows one actual food chain from the intertidal food web of Sanak, including humans. So phytoplankton eaten by cleaner shrimp, eaten by the great sculpin, eaten by the stellar sea lion, eaten by the Aleut. And of course we can uh, put in nodes that are colored uh, mammals, fishes, invertebrates, and, and primary producers. So here, we've put together a full food web. This is for the intertidal system. Um, and here are Homo sapiens uh, up here and at the back. And so this has 171 species, about 1,000 feeding lengths. Um, and you can see there's a good diversity. It's dominated by invertebrates, like it should be, <laughs> even in the uh, uh, intertidal system. And, um, and so one of the things, just eyeballing this, that you can see is that there look, it looks like there's a lot of links to humans. Um, and so we can use this to actually identify and start to compare for the first time explicitly how humans fit into food webs compared to other kinds of predators. Um, so here I've blacked out all the species that are not fed on by humans and left in color all the ones that are fed on directly by humans. So in the system they fed on 50 species, which is, which is almost 30% of the species in the system. This means that humans are generalists. They're feeding on a lot of different things. And not only that, um, they're feeding at all the different levels of the food web. So this is basically means that they're omnivores. They're feeding on everything from primary producers 
and detritus on up to various kinds of invertebrates and then fishes and, and a bunch of marine mammals also. So they're feeding at all the different levels. But we wanna actually start comparing how do humans compare? Do they play special roles in the food web or are they just another predator? So this is a little table that shows in the system the top 10 generalists in terms of how many different prey species they feed on. And right at the top is Homo sapiens feeding on 50. The next closest thing is a sea star that feeds on 39 and you go down from there. So this is showing us right away that humans are actually playing a special role. They're super generalists. They're far more general than the most generalist other species. There aren't, so. Um, so yeah, a lot of the obvious other kind of, you know, omnivorous things aren't there. And right now we're just focusing on the intertidal itself, but we're, trying, we're working towards looking at all the different kinds of systems. And of course, the, this position of humans is particular to the system. You know, in another system, humans might be much more specialized on particular kinds of food. Um, but in this system, they're definitely uh, the super generalist. Another way to look at this data is um, as a histogram. So this shows the number of predators uh, from the intertidal web that have a particular number of prey species. So just to explain this, uh, 21 different predator species have only one prey item. So they're specialists. They specialize on one type of prey only. Uh, and then you have a bunch, uh, 17 that feed on two, you know, fewer, about eight that feed on three and so on, and what you can see right off the bat is that most things feed on less than 10 different species. And most things just feed on one or two species, they're pretty specialized. But then you start, you get into the tail of the distribution that gets, it's very skewed. And so humans are way out here, so they're just the single species that feed on 50 different things. And here's the sea star, the crab, and the sea urchin are the next three generalists. So another thing that we can, we can calculate a lot of different things to compare humans to other species. Um, oh, uh, the only other one I'll talk about that's really interesting is path length. So what is path length? Path length is really just how many links on average you are from every other species in the food web. So you are one link from everything that you prey on and you're two links from everything that your prey feeds on. Does that make sense? Okay, and then so on and so forth. And uh, so you can basically, if you connect humans to every other species in the food web, there's gonna be a shortest path between it and every other species, and then you take an average of that to get this number here. So the, mo the, the taxon <laughs> or the node with the shortest path length is, is detritus, and it's not even a living thing. It's just, it's dead organic matter. And everything feeds on detritus, so that's why it's so closely connected to everything. But humans are right there next at 1.76. They're 1.76 links on average from all other species. And again, they're tied with a couple of things, but then the path links just go up rapidly. Um, and we can look at this a different way, uh, getting back to this kind of graph. Um, this is a food web actually not just of the intertidal, but of the entire nearshore marine system. So now we have 513 species represented, and here's humans again. And I've blacked out the species that aren't within two lengths of humans. So 96% of marine species are within two lengths of humans in this broader North Pacific marine food webs. 491 species. So why is that interesting? I mean, who cares, you know? But it's actually really important. I mean, this is the first time we've been able to put this kind of number on it. Because what it means is that, I mean, people know that we're having big impacts on marine ecosystems. But this shows exactly how closely connected we are to the vast majority of species in this system. And so it means that anything that the humans can do can potentially ramify very quickly throughout the entire food web. So this is the kind of analysis and the kind of understanding we can get from food webs that can help us to understand the resilience of ecosystems, you know, the kinds of impacts humans can potentially have, um, and, you know, and basically why they have the kinds of impacts they do. And again, this is for hunter-gatherers, this is for pre-industrial peoples, but, you know, we can start doing this for other kinds of systems also, and even modern systems. You know, how many species do you have access to at Albertsons or Whole Foods? <laughs> yeah. It does not. So you asked if it implies destructiveness of humans. 
It just means that humans have the potential to have big impacts. However, um, I don't, um, oh yeah, here's a slide that talks about this. So um, in this particular case study, humans were super generalists, they're extremely connected, and they're highly omnivorous. So they're positioned to really greatly affect the ecosystem like I was talking about. However, we know um, just from the archeologists studying the system and our understanding of the ecology, that they didn't um, appear to induce any extinctions in this system. And, um, and there's a number of reasons why that's probably the case, but one of the important reasons why that's probably the case is because they, although they played special roles in the structure of the food web, they played very similar behavioral roles in terms of their dynamics. So what they would do um, is basically they would prey switch. So they've got this huge buffet of possible food items that they can feed on, but they have preferences. We all have preferences, you know? I like sushi, um, but not bluefin tuna. Uh, <laughs> um, so they would go, when the, there would be a salmon run, they'd go hang out by the salmon, and they'd feed on the salmon, but then the salmon run would go away, and maybe it was really sunny out, and the weather was really good, they'd hop in their kayaks, and they'd go out, and they'd hunt marine mammals. They'd go hunt sea lions. But then if it got stormy, they'd have to come in, and they'd go and harvest stuff uh, from the inner tidal, which was much easier to get to. So they're constantly, seasonally and from habitat to habitat, switching among all their possible prey items. They're not going after a bunch of them all at once. We know from modeling the dynamics of, of systems like this, or just kind of model systems, that this kind of prey switching behavior is extremely stabilizing. It's really good for the persistence of species in a complex system. And it's the way that all generalist species act. Um, they basically all prey switch. So in this case, the humans are playing a special topology role in the network but they're not acting special in terms of their behavior, and that's very stabilizing, and, and it allows rare or non-abundant species to basically recover after they've been preyed upon. So that's one story. Did you yeah. find an indication that the super generalists will sort of spread out their consumption so that the, when they're preying on this low trophic level, if they eat all that, it's not going to Choice. Yeah, well, I mean, you actually could get those kind of feedbacks potentially in some systems um, where, you know, basically the impact you're having directly on a species here is going to have indirect impacts on species over here that might be slightly less preferred prey. And actually, that's why we do the dynamical modeling, which I'm not showing right now, because that takes into account all these different indirect pathways of interactions. So you can start to pick apart when that matters and when it doesn't. So, yeah. So does it, doesn't this indicate human uh, destructiveness with the meat? Like today we're overfishing, we're yeah. destroying the environment. Yeah. It does sort of indicate that eventually. I mean, if you put it on a scaling model. Yeah, well, it, it really depends. So, I mean, so you brought up modern practices. So the example I often talk about is bluefin tuna, the bluefin tuna fishery. So in this case, you have a global market, and it's a global luxury market for bluefin tuna, driving the harvesting of bluefin tuna. And in this case, when the Aleut fed on something that they preferred, as it got more rare, its value to them went down because it was harder to get. So that's why they would switch. They would switch to something. However, in the case of these luxury markets, like global markets, like for bluefin tuna, uh, for high-end sushi, uh, you basically have a situation where as the species becomes more rare, its value, its economic value skyrockets. And so you get actually the opposite behavior kicking in where you increase pressure, predation pressure on the bluefin tuna rather than switching away from it to other things. And so that's actually, obviously it's really bad for the bluefin tuna. Some of the populations are being driven to extinction very rapidly, but it also introduces a dynamic into the whole food web that can be very desta destabilizing for the whole system. So that's the kind of stuff that we're trying to start to pick apart using this kind of network approach and network way of uh, thinking and quantifying uh, different things. Okay, any other questions about humans right now? <laughs> okay, we just have a little bit more and then I'll be done. So um, I just wanted to get, I've mostly been showing you stuff about data and some kind of simple questions we can ask. I wanted to just give you an idea of some of the other kinds of questions we actually are looking at, um, but just very briefly. Um, so, one question that uh, people have been thinking about for a long time in terms of food webs um, is, you know, 
is, th is there just a lot of complexity in here that we can't understand? And also, if we compare food webs, like if we compare a food web from a desert to a marine system, um, are they similar or are they completely different from each other? And so kind of how do we pick apart these different issues and how do we compare different kinds of networks? And, you know, I think, you know, 10 years ago even or 15 years ago, if you had asked your average ecologist whether they thought a food web from their desert system was going to look anything like a food web from a marine system, they would have said, no way. You know, the species are totally different. The feeding modes are often different. There's no way that they can be organized in similar ways. So this is kind of what I'm getting at. There's a lot of, uh, here's a desert web, a rainforest web, a lake web, an estuary web, a marine web, and, you know, just eyeballing it, they kind of look different. You can't really tell by all eyeballing, of course, though. I mean, we really need to start digging down and doing some analyses on these. So there's a lot of apparent complexity and also apparent difference between these systems. Um, so how do we start picking apart and comparing the structure of food webs? Well, I've already shown you some histograms of the distributions of prey um, across predators. So that's a type of, it's a link distribution. That's a really fundamental thing people tend to think about. So um, how many links per species are there? And so what this web is, a, or what this figure shows is a distribution for Little Rock Lake. And what it means is that 100% of the species have at least one link. So that's what this data point is up here. Then out here, this data point means that 10% of the species have about 40 links. So it's, you know, and you go out here and one species is 75 links. So this shows the whole distribution across the food web. And these kinds of link distributions are something that people look at for all different kinds of networks, not just food webs. It's a central tendency of network structure. And I don't expect you to read this. This is a complicated slide. <laughs> the only point here is this is 16 examples of degree distributions for food webs. And the thing to take away from looking at this is that the way these curves are, they look pretty different. So here, these are, these are very highly skewed distributions. They're what, these two are what are called power law distributions. But these two um, are less skewed. They're called exponential distributions. Here's another one. But then you start to get these downward curves. These are more uniform distributions. So it looks like you've got a lot of different kinds of distributions and shapes of distributions happening across all these different food webs. So this would seem to suggest that food webs are pretty different, at least in how links are distributed across species. However, it turns out that um, if you normalize the data, if you basically, if you account for the size of the food web and how many links are in it, so if you, if you divide um, the number of trophic links by the links per species in each particular food web, what it does is basically all of these curves that look really different from each other all of a sudden collapse onto a very universal general curve. So just by accounting for the size and complexity of the food web, all of a sudden we see this really strong fundamental similarity in the network structure of the food webs. Um, and, you know, this is the kind of thing that you expect to see in physics, in physical systems. But it turns out that there's some strong generalities even in biological and ecological systems. Does that calculation make the energy transfer a constant so that, you know, you've got 10 billion pounds of bacteria? Yeah. We don't know. We actually don't know that yet. We don't have good enough data in order to test a lot of different hypotheses that we'd like to test, but that's certainly one hypothesis that, you know, is worth thinking about. But the point here is apparent complexity, there's actually underlying simplicity. And just a couple more slides. Um, this, um, so in addition, that was just an empirical analysis, that's just an analysis of data. We also do some, create some simple models. Um, and this is, it, it looks a little complicated, but it's not really. This is just a way to create a fake food web, a model food web. And it basically drops a bunch of fake species down on a line, and then it distributes links among them using some very simple rules. So this image, this very simple model, which is called the niche model, actually it turns out that it, it uh, generates network structure um, that can be evaluated in a lot of different ways. It's very similar to what we see in these very complex food webs, like the Little Rock Lake food web. And so again, there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of research that looks at, tries to uncover this underlying simplicity in different kinds of ways. And then finally, um, 
We also use food webs and a food web framework to look at uh, things like the robustness of ecosystems to species loss. So networks are a really useful framework by which you can start to quantify how likely it is that you're gonna get secondary extinctions when you pull species out of a system. And I just have one little uh, uh, graph on this. This is a, a pollination network. So this is just a special slice of a food web. Here's the plants in a system, and then here's all the pollinators, um, usually different types of bees and flies and things that pollinate and also get uh, feeding, get food from the plants. So here's the full food web. Um, but what happens is you start to pluck away species from this food web. And in this case, uh, what we did is to pull out the most highly connected plants and to see what effect it would have. So um, from this food web, or from this pollination web to this one, only one plant species has been pulled out of it. But you've already actually lost several um, other species from the loss of that one species. So you get these secondary cascading extinctions just because things lose their food items in this case. So if you lose all of your prey items, then you're gonna go extinct also. And so this is a second uh, highly connected plant is pulled out. You're again, you're, now you can noticeably see a reduction in diversity and also the number of links in the system. Pull another one out, another one out, another one out, another one out. So by pulling one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, uh, seven species out, you basically are reduced to an extremely simple food web. You've lost most of your diversity and most of your linkages. So again, we can quantify this. We can start to understand which kinds of networks are gonna be more robust to species loss and which ones are gonna be less robust. And then finally, I'm just gonna pull up uh, sorry, I'm right in front of the camera. <laughs> uh, let's see, escape. This is the last thing. So this is, uh, this is Network 3D. This is that software package I was talking about that my colleagues and I put together. We use this for visualization, but we also use it for analysis and for doing some modeling. And one of the things we can do is Hopefully, hold on. Oh, there it goes. So we've taken a food web, and it actually has a realistic network structure, a niche model structure, and we're running, uh, we're running dynamics on it. So basically, the size of a node, this is a species, is showing, you can think of it either as the population level of that species, or you can think of it as the total biomass of that species. And they're fluctuating, as you can see, because, you know, for example, as this one feeds on that one, its biomass tends to go up, but then it's getting fed on by things, and, you know, as this one's uh, biomass goes down, then there's less for that one. It's basically integrating all of these different dynamics of all the different species. And um, in the case of, and so we do a lot of dynamical modeling, and we, we do what we call in silico experiments. So we're doing experiments on the computer where we can do things like pluck out species and try to understand um, what the robustness is within a dynamics context. And this started off with 20 species. Eventually, two of the species go extinct. This one does, and the other one might already have gone extinct. But after that, 18 species continue to have persistent dynamics. So they don't reach some equilibrium and just kind of stay there. They're constantly fluctuating. And if you think about predator prey, that's what we expect to see. You know, the, the predator feeds on the prey, the prey's biomass goes down, the predator gets more biomass, and then you embed that within the full network and you get these cycling population levels. And you can get all different kinds of shapes of dynamics. And this is just, again, a really useful framework for getting at some more complex types of questions that we wanna ask that we can't do just by looking at the network structure. So um, if anybody's interested in this, email me. Um, that's it for tonight. Thank you for coming and for your patience and for your questions. Feel free to email me uh, at jdunne, my first initial and last name, at santafe.edu. And I'm on the web at the Santa Fe Institute. And thanks a lot. <laughs>